dead simple the plan is to try and build the greatest Spitfire flying today. This is the inside story of a mammoth project to resurrect one of the nation's favourite planes. I could say it's me and a few blokes in a shed, but no, 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 no. It's a few blokes in an aircraft hangar, and I'm going to give them a bit of a hand. Starting with a rusting wreck dug out of a French beach, the aim is to make the rarest Spitfire of all a Mark I using nothing but authentic World War II designs, materials and techniques. This is going to be exactly as the Mark I was built 75 years ago, exactly. The original plane was once flown by an RAF hero whose forgotten tale of daring do involves Dunkirk, crash landings, colditz and even the Queen. Wow. But only if an airworthy plane can be built will the original pilot's daughters finally witness the tribute their father deserves. We're not talking models or anything, we're not playing at it. This is the real deal. The Spitfire is arguably the most successful fighter design ever. Come on, come on then, keep up, keep up. Produced in greater numbers than any other British combat plane, it was introduced in 1938 and wasn't taken out of frontline service until 1954. <laughs> it's not very big, is it? Eh? Fuck. Its V12 engine made it faster than anything else in the sky. It could do 350 miles per hour. Its elliptically shaped wings cut through the air to make it the best handling and easiest to fly plane the RAF had. It's not half a look at it, eh? Hey? Beautiful. This was the aircraft that gave the country its finest hour. Victory in the Battle of Britain, when Germany was just two days away from invading. I mean, it is a bold statement, isn't it? But if it weren't for them, we wouldn't be here now. And I think you're just right, isn't it? Well, we might be eating bratwurst. And yet it was only five months earlier that the Spitfire, and the very plain guy will attempt to remake, had made its debut in serious aerial combat. It was the Dunkirk evacuation, Operation Dynamo. By May 1940, Germany had successfully invaded most of Europe. It relentlessly attacked the remaining 300,000 Allied troops who had been cut off in northern France. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets. 19 Squadron, based at Duxford in Cambridgeshire, had been first to take delivery of the Spitfire. It was tasked with defending the troop evacuation. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. The commanding officer was a very special pilot. Jeffrey Stevenson, yeah, legend. He was trying to provide air cover during, during the mass evacuation. As fighter pilots came, he was as good as they got. Yeah, he was the man. Jeffrey Stevenson had flown in an early version of the Red Arrows aerobatic display team before the war with the famous ace Douglas Bader. Well, we're not the name Douglas Bader, we're ten legs. Yeah, ten legs. Thirty-year-old Stevenson's squadron was amongst the first to reach the deadly skies above Dunkirk. I'm sure if you was amongst that, like you would have just said it was like the end of the world, Armageddon, wouldn't you? Black smoke everywhere. It was like raining planes. Our planes have been shot down. The anti-aircraft fire. Bombs. Witnesses of the time say it was just canny, it was canny. 19 Squadron quickly proved the new Spitfires were, shooting down four Messerschmitts. But soon after, they were dramatically outnumbered. In the ensuing dogfight, two Spitfires were hit. One of them was Squadron Leader Stevenson's. Let's took a bullet to the radiator. He had to force land the Spitfire on the beach we're at now. Yeah, they've been a bit messy. Drenched in boiling engine coolant and with a cockpit full of steam, Stevenson crash-landed into the beach. Somehow he survived. 
Refusing to give himself over to the Germans, he went on the run. We shall never surrender. Stevenson's plane, designation N3200, became a toy for the Germans. Yeah, it was a bit of a trophy to the Germans. I'd have a few choice words for them boys. Who had the last laugh, eh? Within a fortnight, this prized British icon, flown by a national hero, had disappeared into the sand. And it stayed there, left to rot. But in 1986, the remains were unearthed, and eventually they came into the possession of two anonymous collectors obsessed by originality. They were determined to produce a plane that was precisely as Jeffrey Stevenson would have flown it during the war, so it could be displayed in air shows around the country. They sent the wreckage home to the old Duxford Bay Stevenson first flew it from. Today it houses a museum and the best historic aviation engineers in the world. We take pride in what we do and they're put together properly with, with care and attention. Even the bits you can't see that are buried deep within the wing are done correctly. It's a bit like restoring fine artwork, I suppose. You know, It's totally, completely handmade. The ultimate. You can get to work for a Formula One team, but I'm not bothered. Are you bothered? I'm not bothered. Go on, give me another mini cup. NASA. NASA. Working with Americans, I wouldn't get on with Americans. Who else? Give me another job. What, what else would it be like? Sir. Oh, Sir, Large Hadron Collider. Yeah, but to, um, to be honest, I don't think I'm clever enough for that. Getting to work on a Spitfire with a Rolls Royce in it. That's the ultimate. You have made it. That's it. As well as following in the footsteps of the original workforce who built the Spitfire, yep. using their exact same techniques. Look at that. Like a glove. Like a glove. Guy will learn about the power of the Spitfire's guns. I'm not much of a runner here, to be honest. The speed of the ground crew. Right, where do you want me? Learn from the people that built and flew the Spitfire originally. It's amazing what you can do when the chips are down. It's amazing. I don't know what we've done without them. Do you? Experience the flight of his life which takes a surprising twist. This is going to be a bit different, Guy. And uncover the extraordinary tale of the original pilot, Jeffrey Stevenson. I feel very honoured to work on one. I think that's just... It's just a bit, it's a bit much, really. it's a bit of a, I'm a bit of a dither. The two-year project begins in spring 2012. Guy's first day on the job begins with the wrecked remains of Stevenson's plane. I would be the sort of person that'd have someone like that in my front room because it tells a story, doesn't it? But you'd say, what is the point in keeping this? But no, 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 no. It's just good for useful bits of information. Our pipes was rooted. Our bits of wiring was rooted. You know, like, look in here. Look at all that in there. You see? Dig about and you can find name tags on stuff. Look, here. Lamp port, lamp port. Look, on the wiring. There's just loads of... Don't fart near it, it'll drop to bits. <laughs> now, the first job we're going to do, we're going to put these oil unions down there, right? But these here, they could they didn't know, they, they could have been either riveted in or bolted in, but as you can see here, these are bolted in. So ours will be bolted in as it should be. For the finished plane to be truly authentic, it will need a combination of refurbished parts and new sections built to original specifications. We were able to extract a few bits out of it, but um, as for the actual airframe itself, a new one was required. And the company on the Isle of Wight's got the ability to, to make that from scratch. But they're working from original drawings, just like, like we do here. Go on, and what's our money? Uh, we're looking at about 200 to 250,000. You can see it, okay. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> that includes the towel unit as well. Which oh, right, all right. Oh, right. Yeah. Bloody hell. Bloody hell. <laughs> Guy, like the rest of the team, will have to refer to the 75-year-old plans retrieved from an RAF museum. This is the old system diagram here. Are these? Um, these are original drawings. This shows the two unions which I've got here. Yeah. 
The unions are joints which connect pipes taking oil from the engine to the oil cooler. First job, yeah, working on a split pipe. The first assembly jobs are relatively straightforward, but still vital. I'm making a bloody pig's ear of this. If these joints aren't fitted securely, they'll leak. And if they leak, the engine could seize in mid-air. As simple as any bit may seem to fit, every bit is critical in the end. If one bit fails, then another bit may fail, and then, then you have trouble. And what do you reckon to the blokes that have been building them back then? They seem to have a different skill set to what we have now. You know, we have difficulty in replicating them today. Is that right? Nearly half the workforce was female. Peggy Sugden started work at a Wiltshire Spitfire factory in 1942. We were pretty good at it. Yeah, I was very proud of myself, actually. You could do it almost blindfold, really. We were that quick and so easy, really. We had to work eight till eight, Monday to Friday, eight till five Saturdays, and eight to four Sundays. And we just had the one week off in July, just one week. That didn't bother me, I loved it. I, I, I never minded going to work. Back in early 40s, you're going to work knowing that the Germans want to come over and bomb you. Eh? Not easy. It's a bit of pressure, isn't it? I don't think you just wouldn't let that get to you, would you? You'd be to be very British about it, and you'd just get on with it. Keep calm and carry on, wouldn't you? You'd have to be, wouldn't you? Very British. I knew we might be bombed, but it didn't seem to bother me at all. I, I, I just loved it. I loved every bit of it. I loved the camaraderie. I loved it. It, it. it was beautiful. As part of the latest generation to work on a Spitfire, Guy clearly has a lot to live up to. Of course I'm up to the job. Hey? All right, I'm willing to learn. I'm not going in there. There's no, I'm not going in there. Just trying, you know, of course I can do that. I don't know. I'm holding my hands up and saying, look, boys. I've never worked on a plane before, and I've definitely never worked on a Spitfire before. You know, you need to, you know, point us in the right direction. But I'll give it me all, I'll give it my best shot. No question. Definitely, of course I can do it. Guy's fitted his first two parts. But if this is truly to be the greatest Spitfire ever made, it still needs a quarter of a million rivets. A rebuilt Rolls-Royce engine, fresh paint, new wings. Okay. Real guns and a propeller worth six figures before finding out if the whole thing is good enough to fly. Guy Martin is helping to build the nation's favorite plane, a Mark I Spitfire. This particular aircraft N3200 was shot down over Dunkirk in 1940, and now the wreckage is being used as the basis for the most authentic Spitfire to be built since World War II. We'll handle it. It won't be easy, as is clear on a recent restoration, the Spitfire was a complex, state-of-the-art aircraft. They're yeah, the most sophisticated fighter the RAF had. Just look in here. Look at the way the buttons finished off. You see? I don't want to press it. Do you know how I'm right to press it? No, I best not press it. I don't want any bodies. <laughs> in the mid 1930s, the aggressive foreign policy of Hitler's Germany rung alarm bells in Britain. A rearmament program saw the tender for a new fighter plane won by Reginald Mitchell from Stoke on Trent an aeronautical engineer with no formal training. In 1931, his seaplane had reached a record-breaking 407.5 miles per hour. That design was adapted into the Spitfire. The first plane rolled out of a Southampton factory in 1938. It's the fastest single-seater fighter in the world. Every young pilot who took the helm immediately fell in love. I was 18. Now, all they said was, there's a Spitfire, go and fly it. If you break it, there'll be bloody hell to pay. Thank you. And I remember vividly walking out and seeing this lithe-looking thoroughbred creature sitting there. I thought, my goodness, am I in charge of that lethal-looking thing? I got in it, they showed me how to start it, and then I opened the throttle. 
and the acceleration was nothing like I'd ever known, and she seemed to hurl herself into the air with me hanging on to it. It was a thing apart, and it seemed to flow about the sky. It was responsive, it was very light on the controls, and it was a revelation. I remember thinking, well, this is lovely, I was mucking about around the clouds, and I've got to get this thing back on the ground, which is quite an important part of any trip, you see. And we arrived on the ground, quite simply, the aeroplane flew me. Squadron leader Jeffrey Stevenson, English gent and distinguished pilot, was in charge of N3200 when it was shot down. His diaries reveal what happened after he crashed during the Dunkirk evacuation. They've gave me a copy. I wouldn't trust me with the original diary. Yeah, some interesting reading. Some interesting reading. And there's one bit here that reads, um, I had forced landed on the beach south of Cali. Was not a time for emotion, but rather cool planning. Nothing of the sort occurred. Nothing of the sort occurred. According to the diaries, Stevenson evaded capture for 11 days, walking 110 miles through occupied France to Brussels. He sought refuge at the US Embassy, but was turned away because the Americans were not yet part of the war. Yeah, well, he's a bit snooker now, isn't he? He's on the street, like German occupied, really, at that stage, wasn't it? If he'd have got captured, and they said, well, you're obviously a spy, kaboom blown his brains out. No questions asked. Stevenson had no alternative but to turn himself in and become a prisoner of war. By May 1940, Germany had successfully invaded most of Europe, but Hitler was furious that Britain had rejected his offer of peace. The British Navy and Air Force posed a huge threat, so he ordered them to be destroyed. The plan was first to gain aerial superiority over the channel before landing his infantry by sea. The Battle of Britain was about to begin and the RAF needed more planes, fast. To help increase production, a new factory at Castle Bromwich in Birmingham started producing Spitfires in May 1940. Today it's used by the Jaguar Car Company, with works of art reminding the locals of the area's history. I'm not into modern art, and that's what we're calling that, isn't it, modern art. But I can appreciate that no one's forgotten, and I think that's right. And then we've got here, is, is a nose cone, and uh, some knob has gone and graffitied it. Show a bit of respect. Do you know about these here? Yeah. Come on, whatever. That Come is on. the Spitfire wing. Is it? Fair play, yeah. mate. What do you think to it all? What do I think to it all? Yeah. Well, for start, it's a bit of history, isn't it, really? Right. This place is like out World War II and all that, don't it? Do you know it's what I mean? Spot on, mate. Do you know what I mean? I'm impressed. Yeah, I'm yeah. impressed that you, that you know all about that. <laughs> that's great. No, spot it's on, cool. mate. The factory itself is also one big monument. Go on, watch your sound. We've seen the first bit. You see? Most of. Most. Most of Britain's Spitfires are made here from 39 to 45. The factory was a colossal undertaking, the size of 80 football pitches. In today's prices, it cost the government nearly 400 million pounds. Its huge size made it an obvious target for German bombers, so the whole building was covered in camouflage paint. There is a bit of camouflage left, you see all there? But it didn't stop, they still dropped over 200 bombs. To begin with, production at the factory was a fiasco thanks to the very worst examples of British industrial unrest. We had too many old boys stuck in their old ways, they knew best, saying that they're going to build 60 Spitfires a week. All these old boys, oh yeah, yeah, 60, 60, 60 Spitfires a week. Anyway, April 1940 had come and they hadn't turned out one, not one. There were more than 3,000 different blueprints for a Spitfire, and the foreman, recruited from car maker Morris and used to simpler manufacturing, wanted to ignore them. You still get it now, don't you? I've been doing it this way for 50 years. That's the way it'll be done. That's the way it'll be done. Oh, boy, stuck in the way. We need some fresh blood in there. We need the whip needed to be cracked. And it was. Lord Beaverbrook, generally regarded as the unpleasant and unreasonable proprietor of the Daily Express, 
was in charge of the Ministry of Aircraft Production. He was as passionate about Spitfire production numbers as he was about his newspaper circulation. Within a year, he'd kicked Castle Bromwich into life with new management, turning it into Europe's most efficient factory. The north side, all the wings were them over there. Over there, engines in the fuselage, and here is where all the uh, assembly took place. 85 were being turned out a week, and that's some going on. And all the workers said all they did is work and sleep, nothing else. Fair play. Proper. At its peak, more than 14,000 people worked at Castle Bromwich. It was one of the first places to award equal pay to men and women. I don't know what we've got here. I think this will be the fuel tank assembly. You see there, 40% of the workforce was women. We were about 18, 19. Most of them, a lot of them, were girls I'd gone to school with. Yeah, they are making fuel tanks. Yeah, flat out making fuel tanks. And their speciality was riveting. We had to buy our own tools, by the way. Chisels and screwdrivers and everything we had to provide ourselves. If you needed a chisel in case your rivets weren't flat, you know, you would have to chisel them off, which I didn't do very often. I generally got them right. <laughs> and look here, there's a lass here riveting. No pressure her out, but that's the Prime Minister. That's Winston Churchill looking over her. No pressure, love. No pressure. It was quite nice because I was earning loads of money. <laughs> Much more than I got as an apprentice at hairdressing. By heck. Riveting a fuel tank is Guy's next job back at Duxford. The team are eight months into the N3200 project. These early Mark 1s, the fuel tank doesn't have a, like a crash or bulletproof covering like the later versions, so it is even more important for it to be leak proof. And that needs precision riveting. And like in Castle Bromwich, Guy will have to do this by hand rather than rely on a modern day robot. If you're putting a rivet in a place of stress, like on the bottom of a fuel tank, you have to use these hardened rivets. But you can't rivet a hardened rivet up. So what you have to do, you have to heat it up to 485 degrees and that then makes the rivet more malleable. You know, you can rivet it up then. The rivets, made of the same steel alloy as 75 years ago, are then frozen to preserve that malleable state. There are just two hours to use them before they harden. Nick Dean is in charge. What's the plan then now? We've got some in? Yeah. Where do you want me? Right, so what yeah. we'll do, start from the middle and basically work outwards. Just bring it down gently. All right. Yeah. Yeah. A rivet is a quick way of permanently joining two pieces of metal together. Is that all right? Yeah, looks fine. The shaft is pushed through a hole and has its end flattened by a rivet squeezer exerting a ton of force to fix it in place. This tank here is 37 gallons. And the tank that sits above it is 48 gallons. So what's that, 85 gallons altogether. <clears throat> when she was up in the air, she'd be using a gallon a minute. I mean, that is thirsty, isn't it? A gallon a minute. Yeah, that is some going. You could not tip it away faster, could you? Really? Could you? If you're licking on, you've got enough fuel for an hour's worth of flying. So that's only half an hour there, half an hour back. Any more than an hour, and we're going to be in bother. Yeah. yeah I'll get these rivets. Nick's been on this five weeks. I don't want to be knackering it up now. My bloody riveting, it's not a bloody laughing matter, is it? <laughs> five weeks gone into this. It's finished. Exactly as it would have been done originally. The job's worth doing, it's worth doing well. Yeah, fair play. The Battle of Britain began on July the 10th, 1940. It was the first campaign to be fought entirely in the air and became the Spitfire's most celebrated moment in history. Hitler's plan was first to attack naval convoys in the Channel. Then Britain's airfields. And then the aircraft factories and finally toward an indiscriminate bombing of the towns and cities. An RAF pilot might be sent up five times a day to fend off the relentless onslaught of the Luftwaffe, who were making up to 1,800 sorties in a 24-hour period. It was exhausting work for the pilots, who were as young as 19, but they readily admitted the real heroes were the mechanics and ground crew who quickly repaired, refueled, and rearmed their planes. 
the officers were bringing the mechanics food, eh? How often would you get that happening? I don't know, everyone, everyone sees the mechanics, don't they? Oh, it's only a fitter, only a mechanic, only a fitter. But these you've got the officers bringing the mechanics food. And so obviously the officers appreciated, not just appreciated, they knew that without the mechanics, that was it. Nothing happened. Air superiority depended on speed, and the mechanics had a trick up their sleeve to eke out every last mile per hour. He said, the servicing I did was 100%. The riggers and I were always polishing because we were told the pilots could get an extra four mile an hour that way. These lads are polishing because I think it'll get you know, another four mile an hour out of the plane. Hey, that's pride in your work, is that, ain't it? We'll see what else we can find. We've got a bit of reading to do. The Spitfire had enough fuel for around an hour's flight and enough bullets for 14 seconds of firing. The ground crews took great pride in how quickly they could perform a pit stop to refuel and rearm even though they were targets for bombing themselves. Guy persuades some of his Duxford colleagues to see if they're a match. They say a team of four blokes could rearm a Spitfire, what was it 2,400 rounds in three and a half minutes? Yeah. Right. So get out of these boxes, yeah. scarper over there. How are you fixed? I'll oh, see where they go. <laughs> right, so we're going for it? Yeah. No, I'll just follow you, what you boys do. I don't really know what I'm doing. Okay. Already? Oh, it's starting now. It's starting to start washing out. Go! Oh, I'm not much of a runner head. No, don't I'm overtake me. <laughs> <laughs> right, where do you want me? He's carrying a carry, he's quicker than me. <laughs> where do you want me? <laughs> First of all, you whip off that long panel. Yeah. Come on, guy! He's trying his best. I'm missing the screwdriver and scratch the penny, boys will never forget it. I'll do this one. Okay. All right. Put that down there. Pull that back. Hold the button. That's the used bullet, so they'll, they'll have just been spent on a lot of germs. Okay. All right. With two of the three and a half minutes gone, they're only just threading the first ribbon to help guide the belt of bullets into the gun. Must have been difficult in those times to do what they were doing, quick turn rounds and yeah, looking up at the skies, thinking when are they coming over to drop bombs on you? Or, yeah, brave people. Shut the lid. Uh. Yeah. That's three minutes. That's three minutes. This is just putting the bullets in because you'd have another team cleaning all the breaches and the barrels as well. Yeah. Uh, there'll be other people okay. checking yeah. radios. Another one will be walking around to see if there's any damage on the aircraft. Ten, Unclip it. Nine, eight, eight, seven, six, five, four. Pull it all through. Three, Pull it through. Yeah. Two. One, time's up. Oh, we'll just carry on then. Well, we're nowhere near done, but let us carry on. OK, gun cocked. Is that us? Yeah, that's us. We'll panel up now. So that's taken us, what? We've done two boxes in, what, thick end of five minutes, I suppose. <laughs> and those boys were doing eight boxes in three and a half minutes. They were. I'd say it's impressive, but as impressive as that is, if that was your job, you would make sure you were the quickest in the world. It? That was, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's all about getting them back up in the air, wasn't it? Yeah, it's impressive, it's impressive. It is impressive. It's time to get back to work. The next stage of the project will be crucial in trying to make N3200 the greatest flying Spitfire, building the wings that give the plane its outstanding advantage in combat. Guy Martin is helping out on a two-year project to remake one of the rarest Spitfires of all, a Mark I. As you can see, we've got a lot of work to do. It was salvaged from a Dunkirk beach after crash landing in 1940. And that was when it was dug out in 1986. The anonymous owner has insisted everything is done as authentically as possible, using original techniques. No, that's not right. It's not perfect. It needs to be a bit tighter. Starting again, that's not right. I'm rushing in. Doesn't matter which panel you lift up or where you look, it's just attention to detail. It's absolutely perfect in every single way. The project is 10 months old and the fuselage is ready to be painted. 
John Loweth has 20 years experience and does the entire process freehand as it was done originally. The only difference is that these days there's no lead in the paint. To do the four coats of top coats, it will take about an hour. Early Spitfires fought mostly over England's fields during the Battle of Britain, so were painted brown and green. Later, as the fight was taken to the enemy across the channel, they were painted grey and green to better blend into the sea. I've done probably about 10 aircraft. This one I, I'm, I'm quite pleased with, I do like this one. The plane is now ready for its most intricate parts, which will test Guy's engineering ability to the limit the wings. This is Spike, he's the wing team right, leader. Right, Pleased to meet you mate, how's, how's it going? going? Alright yeah. mate, hey. well, alright, what's the plan? Right, now, here we go, 1936 drawing. This is basically a, what we call a general assembled drawing. Yeah. Building a wing begins with the internal framework of supports called ribs. Each rib is handmade and must be strong enough to withstand the stresses of a Spitfire's 400 mile per hour dive. We're making What's that, that number five? rib five centre portion. Yes. You're forming that boom, which is called a top boom. Yeah. They start on the shrinker. In you go, that's sit. The Spitfire's responsive handling relied on the precise curves yeah. of its wings. And here the bends of its frame are made by pulling the metal fractionally inwards. That's it, and just move it along every half inch or so. By doing that, that's gently curving that material. Without putting it under any stress. Without putting it under any stress. That's it. You see? Right, very subtle then. Very, very subtle. Bloody hell. When they put the beam on the layout board. Like that up there, like so. Spike's experienced eye spots a problem. Well, as I can see from You're this. You're a tree. From here. Yeah. To there. That's slightly over curved. Right, so it was a bit taken okay, out. Okay, so that one a bit taken out now. All right, yeah, that's fine. That's just undoing everything that was done over there. You can't, that's what you can't teach someone that, can you? Hey, just like, it's, it's, how many years you've been, you did that, this 30, sort of 50, 30 years 30 I've, years I've been in the game, yeah. So the same on the bottom? Yeah. Just same on the bottom. If you don't get it right, it don't fly. Or even worse still, wings could fall off or break up. There's no substituting for the correct fasteners and procedures. You do it right, or you don't do it at all. Basically, that's a goer. The first part is complete, but each rib can contain up to 20 different parts. To get to that there, I take a week, right? But in a whole Spitfire, there's 124 of them. Hey, it's a week to make one. Hey, you can see we're going to be here a day or two, can't you? Hey, what do you reckon, Spy? What's next? One wing is made up of 3,000 different parts, and each must marry up perfectly to the next. Once the ribs have been completed, the largest parts can be fitted. How well do you want me? The exterior skins. 250 pins are screwed in so the wing can be fine-tuned before it's permanently riveted. So yeah, the whole idea is getting this edge here to line up perfectly. You see it? Look there, that spot on there, isn't it? But up here, we've got a bit of a gap, and then it closes up back up there. It's taken off five times yesterday. It's been on and off five times today, and probably another five more times, just to get it, just to get it perfect. It's all perfect. It has to be perfect. No if spots on there, it's perfect. Sometimes it can take forever. <laughs> it's just been a bit of a perfectionist on the side, I think, where you're just not happy until it is exactly right. You know, you need that little bit of mentality, I think. The repetition of the job is probably one of the hardest parts of it. So it's uh, very laborious, but it's got to be done right. The work continues. Back off again. Back off again. Unpinning. Shaving. Shaping. Refitting. Unpinning. Shaving. And shaping again. A bit nervous. In 1940, it took just days to make a wing. Not today. A year per wing. A year per wing. So you don't get fed up with it? Not really. No? No. Yeah. No, no, no. No? No, no. Good lads. It's finally perfect. Work of art. The section is then attached to the rest of the wing framework, 
it will take another six months effort to complete. It was during the three and a half month long Battle of Britain where that sleek wing design helped make the Spitfire so effective. The Germans have lost one plane every 42 minutes. How's that, Mr. Goebbels? The plane was incredibly responsive, helping it to outmaneuver German fighters more easily than its Battle of Britain brother, the Hurricane. The Hurricane wasn't bad, but uh, it was more like the, the cart horse and the race horse, if you know. The Spitfire was the one you wanted. It looked better. It was a very beautiful aeroplane. It was better at altitude than the Hurricane, and it performed better. There's no doubt about that. It did perform better. I've flown both. Although the Hurricane shot down more planes overall, its job was to target the slower German bombers, and that was only possible because the Spitfire had first gunned down the more difficult to hit German fighter escorts. But the real key to success was the chain of radar stations along the south and east coasts, which meant the RAF knew exactly where the Luftwaffe were going to be. They could set a course to intercept, wait at altitude for the German planes to appear, then dive to shoot them down. To experience what those British fighter aces went through, Guy is about to take a once-in-a-lifetime flight. I feel rather official, and to be honest, a right lucky bugger. I'm having a go in a Spitfire. I'm having a go in a Spitfire. I know um, Spitfires are only single-seaters, but they did late 40s as training planes. There was a lot of twin-seaters made, and that's what I'm having a go in. A converted Mark 9. I'll get to it. you reckon? It's got a lot like I know what I'm doing. I'm only the passenger. We've got, we've got to work with Cliff, because Cliff knows what he's doing. Right, Cliff. How's it going, mate? We're off. You're the man. You know what you're doing. Retired Air Marshal Cliff Spink has flown Spitfires for 21 years and straps Guy into his parachute. I'm sort of a little bit nervous, a little bit nervous, but I'm more excited. Clip up. Okay, we're starting. Contact. Right. Let's rock and roll then. Brilliant. Power up. Yeah. Feeding a bit of fly clutter. Well, what do you think, guys? Absolutely brilliant. We're doing just over 200 miles an hour. What a job, What a job. Right. Put your hand on the control column. Yes. Okay. You have control. Okay, so as the nose comes up, you keep it forward. Like this. I'm doubling our sensitivity. The left wing goes down to the right. That's it. And by the way, look forward. And you'll see my hands are up here. I can see it, yeah. You're flying a spin bar. <laughs> That's jolly good. Well done. Okay, I'll take back. I have control. Thank you very much. Meanwhile, completely unbeknownst to Guy, a Messerschmitt prepares to take off and turn this pleasure flight into a dogfight. Guy Martin is about to get a pilot's eye view of a Battle of Britain dogfight between a Spitfire and a Messerschmitt 109, the plane tasked with escorting German bombers over the south coast of England. You're getting nervous, Hal, and you're thinking, I know the bad guys are around. See that? Yeah, I can see it. Look that's rolling into your 
60 block. Very difficult to see him, isn't it? So what would you be doing now in the bar situation? Well, if you didn't see him and you weren't moving your wings about, you're about to get shot down. So what do you do? Do you dive to your... Yeah, we will show you that. Just a second. Never stay still. If you stayed still, straight and level, for more than about 10 seconds, you were killed. I realized that if I could see my antagonist, I felt I could outfly him in a Spitfire. As you can see it from the other side now, yeah. it's us bouncing the 109. Right, now we really are in a fail state. Really. The art of dogfighting is to fly faster and turn tighter than your opponent, so you can maneuver them into your sights. <laughs> Compared to the 109, early Spitfires had less ammunition, weren't as fast and couldn't climb as quickly. But they had two crucial advantages. They were less tiring to fly and had much better high-speed maneuverability. If you got in a dogfight, flying manual went out of the window. Be brutal with it, chuck it around. Yeah and a Spitfire would respond. In extreme maneuvers, it was possible to pull 6G, enough force to ripple the metal on the wings and severely affect the pilot. Pulling out of a dive, you can hardly lift your hand from the stick, and you feel your eyes going, and you can black out. There was one time when I was right behind a 109 and it's you or him and it, you'd rather it was him. I don't know anybody who felt that they had killed somebody. They'd shot down an aeroplane, not a pilot. I'm now coming up to about 400 yards. Now that is frantic smoke. It's very noticeable when you're flying with people who have got an empathy with machines. They do get very quickly into the sense of the aeroplane. I mean, I could have given that to somebody else and they would have been all over the sky. So I'm. Well done you. Oh, that, thank you very much. Yeah. I'm honoured that you, you let me fly. I'm honoured. That was really good. And you can say you've flown a Spitfire. Yeah, that's not a lie. I've flown a Spitfire. It's not a lie. <laughs> the mission to create the most authentic Spitfire since the war has reached a landmark stage. It's time to fit the aeroplane's heart. The 27-litre V12 engine. The engine it had in it is the Rolls-Royce Merlin. The legendary engine. And I'm that into him. I bought my own Merlin. And I've got a Merlin. It's going in my front room and it runs. The engine for N3200 runs as good as new. The original core engine was sent down to a company in Gloucestershire where it was completely stripped. Every part is measured, made sure it's within tolerance, and then it will hopefully give 250 hours of service before it needs dismantling again. But before the engine is fitted, its frame must be attached to the bulkhead. So how many hours he making this frame? Probably about 400. 400 hours. Has that been on that? The engine weighs more than half a ton, so the four bolts which support the frame must fit securely. I was an aircraft fitter, and I always remember these uh, tapered engine bolts. They used to be bolts about that long and it was, it was turned on a taper and then ground, radial ground. It kept me rather busy. To keep the bolts in place, a hole is drilled in the head to accept a locking pin. It's very easy to snap such a thin drill bit and the consequences are costly. If you break the drill off or drill off line, then these are a special bolt which have to be specially made in the machine shop, so they've got quite a long lead time. About three months? Enough. So if we mess that up, we won't be able to put the engine in. We used to get G'd up sometimes. They'd be short of a certain item, and then they used to come down and mark it up on the board. Red hot, they used to put on a part which was missing. I think it was head down, get on with it. I enjoyed it. 
and I'd do it all over again. Your turn. If Guy snaps the bit, the project will grind to a halt. But his steady hand does the job. Wow. And the bolt is locked in place with a split pin so it can't come undone. The 1000 horsepower Merlin 3, the same type of engine that was originally fitted to N3200, is hoisted into place. Guy Spitfire is one step closer to returning to the sky. Getting excited. You're not beating that, are you? I could fit as many Scania clutches, I could fit as many Volvo turbos as I like, and nothing's going to beat that. Everything Merlin in a Spitfire. He's more excited, are you more excited? I'm always excited putting it's an engine in. It's always excited. <laughs> I'm quite proud of the engineering side of it. I think everybody was proud of it. Everybody, even the old ladies in the street, the Spitfire all we had. <laughs> it was an iconic plane, absolutely iconic. I'm very proud of the old Spit. The decisive Battle of Britain offensive came on September the 15th, 1940. Germany launched two huge waves and Britain scrambled every fighter it had. The RAF shot down 60 planes and lost 26 of their own. Germany was due to invade just two days later, but with the RAF clearly still at full strength, the invasion of Britain was called off. The Spitfire had been instrumental in inflicting Hitler's first defeat, the first turning point in World War II. But it wasn't the last time the Spitfire played a crucial strategic role. Constantly updated to become more powerful and better armed, its versatility saw it serve in the Mediterranean, Burma and the Pacific. In 1944 it provided an overwhelming force when the Allies took the fight to Hitler on D-Day and was the first plane to touch down in liberated France before soon taking off to press home the attack. But star pilot Jeffrey Stevenson was missing out. After crash landing N3200 at Dunkirk, his letters home tell of what happened to him as a prisoner of war, including this Nazi dossier revealing he spent three weeks in solitary confinement. So wherever they put him, he'd escape. Then he'd get captured and they'd put him in another place and he'd escape. So then the Germans got hold of him the last time and says, right, Jeffrey Stevenson, we've had enough of you, mates. You're off to Colditz. And we've heard of Colditz, haven't you? You're not getting out of there in a hurry. And who did he meet in Colditz? Douglas Bader, his old mate. And that's when they started concocting this fancy glider in the loft of Colleys, planning this dramatic escape. Which never happened, it never happened, but it's a British spirit, isn't it? Even when imprisoned, he was a thorn in the Nazi side. Stevenson's old plane is three quarters of the way through its painstakingly accurate rebuild. Well, she's checking shape, wing skins are on, she's had a lick of paint, she, she's looking like an aeroplane. Even the oil unions, the very first parts Guy ever fitted, have been plumbed in. Today she's ready to have her wings bolted on, with seven pins measured to a thousandth of an inch. Each wing, they have three at the top and four at the bottom. Just a normal bolt, you can see you've got the thread there, that's the main shank and that's like the screw head there to hold it in place. What we're going to problem is, is that the fit is absolutely critical. The diameter we're going for is um, 937 and a half thou. You see that? There's a thousand thous in an inch. A thou is about the thickness of a, of a human hair. This is the bolt. And what we've got here is 945.4 of a thou. So it's about eight airs we've got to take off that. So yeah, um, eight thou. Not nine thou, not eight and a half thou, eight thou. We'll get cracking. We'll go see the man. We'll go see the man, see how to steer the machine. Locate that into there. Paul Wilson is in charge of the cylindrical grinder, similar to the machine that would have been used for this job originally. It takes an hour to try and carefully shave off the necessary eight widths of a hair. That'll be your last cut. Guy's workmanship impresses Mo, the boss. His standards are perfect. Perfect. You could 
give him a job tomorrow without, without a worry. And you could quite happily let him do most things on the aeroplane. You know, he's got the feel for it. But despite the care and attention, the pin is too tight to fit. That's because you've been holding it in your hand for the last two minutes. I know. We've just been stood, we were stood there talking about, what was we talking about? Price of fish. And I've had, I've had that in my hands the whole time. You feel it, feel that? Feel how warm that is. It's really warm. Feel how warm that is. Stone cold. Yeah. Obviously, it's been warm, it's going to expand. But the heat of my hands has made it expand enough not to go in the hole. That tells me that's three tenths oversized from what we made it on the machine. So the, the heat, with, with him holding it in his hand for the last 15 minutes, has, has grown that by three tenths. After half an hour, that'll cool down enough. That'll be perfect. Once cooled, the guy tries the pin again. It fits, and Mo is brought over to inspect. Yep, so far so good. Yeah. 13 more to go. Yep. Each wing weighs the same as two men. Okay, go for another push in. Sit. Look at that. Like a glove. Like a glove. Guy is left to make the final fixings. The Spitfire may have invoked love and affection from all who saw it, but it existed for one sole deadly purpose. It was a mobile gun platform. In the early days, it was fitted with four Browning machine guns in each wing. But the relatively small .303 rounds soon struggled to penetrate the ever-improving armor of enemy aircraft. So later, the guns were uprated to a larger 50 caliber bullet. Guy wants to witness the destructive power of these machine guns for himself and is meeting up with old friend Dave Main, an historic armourer. Now, mate. All right. How's it going? All right, fine, yeah. yeah. Go on, what have we got here? Right, 50 calibre machine gun, developed in 1921. This is now in, still in service, and so it's got a, a life of uh, 92 years. How we load our rounds. This very gun was once used in a Spitfire and has now been adapted to use a hand trigger. So what you do is you get in behind your target area and then line it up and then obviously fire it. And then keep your fingers on the trigger. Bang, 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 bang. Okay. You will go. The tanks would hold roughly 300, 350 rounds of ammunition which would last firing uh, continuously of about 14 seconds. That's all they would get. Some of the dogfights were at perhaps from 25,000 feet down to 5,000 feet. And they'd just see briefly an like enemy aircraft flash by and they were down in front of them and they just give it a quick burst. Brrr, brrr. That was it. That, that was about 10 or 15 rounds of ammunition gone <laughs> in, in, in a fraction of a second. I never thought about anyone being at the end of it. Never passed, but never passed our minds. It was all part of part of the job. To see how much damage such a short amount of firing time can do, guy needs a target. I'm finding this sacrilege, to be honest. But we need something to simulate enemy aircraft. We found a scrap car. Just happens that it's a BMW. Hey, they made engines for the Luftwaffe. Just a coincidence, just a coincidence. It pains me. It's got good tyres on it. It's got parking sensors. The paintwork's not bad. But it's German. We're going to get her own back. She's having it. She's having it. Guy Martin is about to find out what damage a Spitfire machine gun could do. Okay, good. 
Ready? Ready? Yep. She having some more? <laughs> yep. Okay, you want to traverse one click. Yep. Come down slightly now. Okay. Yep. The Browning fires around six bullets a second. In the heat of battle, new pilots would often hold the trigger open as soon as they saw the enemy, wasting all their bullets in one go. Yeah, you get the young ones, and you just go in there, shoot your load, get it all over and done with. You know, you've only got 10 seconds, you get it all over and done with straight away. But then if you was an experienced pilot, they knew to get as near as you could and only shoot two second blast, just go in there. And it's just, yeah, yeah. Yeah, one two second burst. <laughs> I meant business there, she was having it. <laughs> Certainly was. Again and again. Firing from a static position at a static target is one thing. Firing from a moving platform at a moving target is far harder. They're coming towards you at 300 miles an hour. You're doing 300 miles. That's 600 miles an hour. And you only, it happened very, very quickly. It was just a and that was it. You were through. With 100 rounds fired, Guy inspects the damage. Well, it doesn't look absolute carnage, does it? It was all right, the bullet going through, but when that bullet's gone through your Messerschmitt or it's gone through your Heinkel, you know, it takes bits with it, and those bits then become like another bullet, and they just create carnage. Now, look here. Look, as that bullet's come through, it's picked up the shrapnel and it's just gone everywhere. Look, it's ripped the, it's ripped the bloody radio out. It's ripped the bloody radio out. And look at it, like I was just looking under the bonnet. It's crackers. Come and have a look here. Come and have a look. Come and have a look. It's ripped half the engine out. Hey? And that's what pilots were trained to do. You know, you go for the pilot, go for the engine. They were the two things that was going to stop the plane the quickest. But then just kind of look around the other side, it's just mad. I mean, look there, we've nearly turned it into a convertible. Hey, and then you look at that door. Look at that. That sort of sums it up, doesn't it? As beautiful as the Spitfire was, and we can call it beautiful, can't we? Really, it was just a killing machine. It's pretty. Guy returns to Duxford to fit the final part to N3200. A brand new propeller has been made by a company in Gloucestershire. A problem here could prove costlier than any other part of the project. Go on, it's expensive then. It is, yes, yeah, about uh, 150,000 pounds worth. And heavy too, around about 200 kilos. Okay. Oh, oh. Uh, another one. Okay. Bit more. Go on. Up. Now down. Okay. Have you ever heard of a prop dropping off when while in flight? I have when they've been testing. <laughs> nice. If we get it on, it won't come off. But if we tear the seal, it will just leak oil and spray all the screen and everything. Mm -hmm. Don't need that on a maiden voyage. Nah, no, it's not, it's not good rushing at this time. When positioned, the prop head has to be fastened to the shaft. Making sure it's tight enough requires some extra leverage. If I'm hung on the end of that, it, you know it's tight. You know it's tight. FT, FT, we call it. Yeah, she's tight. Okay. All right. Yeah. I worked it out. Yeah, about six foot, just hanging on it. Then I'll hit it with a hammer. Okay. 
That's very tight now. Well, on. So we're getting there now. Yep, that's good. Once the engine covers are back on, the aeroplane will be complete. N3200 will be ready to be flown for the first time since Jeffrey Stevenson crash landed in her. In 1945, the Americans liberated Kolditz and Jeffrey Stevenson was released. The war was over. Stevenson resumed his distinguished career, serving both King George and the Queen in the honorary role of aide-de-camp, assisting them at military events. Air Commodore Stevenson, commanding the static display, escorts Her Majesty. So yeah, pilot for King George, bit of a helping hand for the Queen, eh? One plane at it, was he? They won't plane at it. Then in 1954, Stevenson was selected as a crack pilot to test the supersonic Sabre jet fighter in the USA. But having survived dogfights, a crash landing, and being a prisoner of war, this peacetime project was to be his final mission. An early design fault led to him losing control and crashing before it was possible to eject. Jeffrey Stevenson died aged 44 leaving two daughters, Varian and Victoria. He was the boy. He was the boy, yeah. So he's saying, well, whatever we do here, we've got to do the job right, haven't we? It's two years and two weeks since Guy first started work on N3200. He's about to see if she'll fly. If everything goes well, she'll be granted a permit to fly and be one of just four airworthy Mark Ones in existence. She's looking a treat. She's looking, she's looking a treat. To add to the occasion, Guy's invited along some rather illustrious guests related to the plane's pilot, Jeffrey Stevenson. Jeffrey's daughters, both of Jeffrey's daughters, um, Vey and Victoria. You all right, ladies? Hello. Morning. Pleased to meet you, ladies. Pleased yeah. to meet you. Victoria was seven when her celebrated father died, while younger sister Varian was just five. Our father was uh, very kind but strict person, and it's a great shame he died so soon. We've never really sat around and talked about my father. So to be here with Tor, you know, and, and um, remember, you know, Daddy, and experience this together, that's quite special for me. Right, ladies. Yep. Are you ready? Yes. Are you ready for this? Okay. There's a lot of planes. It's the one, it's one there. Okay. Well, here, here, lads. Yeah. Open the door, please. Cheers, mate. Right. Beautiful. Ooh. Gorgeous. There was a plane that, you know, it was part of his life that he sat in and flew all those years ago and it just looked, I don't know, friendly. Oh, Can you have a look? Yeah, so, please. Yeah, just as a mat one should. I thought, what a beautiful plane. Not big, and of course, looking spiff, it was, yeah, great. And just looking at it, there was a picture of the plane on Dunkirk Beach, right? And you could see from there that there was this rear view mirror there. You see that mirror on the back? Yeah. Right? That's not a standard thing on a Spitfire. But they say your dad had this idea, he wanted a rear view mirror, so that was nicked off an MG car. And they could see from this picture, there was a German stood on it, like proud as punch. And that's why they replicated that. So that's not on any other. That, that was just on this, just on your dad's. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I can almost feel him here at the moment, actually. I can almost, I mean, he just would have, he just loved being, getting in there. Seeing all this and seeing the Spitfire and seeing yeah. Tor in the yeah. Spitfire, particularly. Like father, like daughter, eh? I mean, Tor has the same sort of colouring as daddy. He has the same bone structure, obviously a little bit smaller. How do you start it? Is there a key? It's brought it all home and I don't know, it, it's, um, well, you know, I was so young when it all, when my father was no more. 
and now doing this I feel like you know I know a lot more about who he was and what his passions were and um, aeroplanes and, which was a major part of his life aeroplanes it's remarkable absolutely you're happy I'm happy and I'm sitting in it right now sitting in your dad's plane when this plane left Duxford in 1940 it never came back now it's time to see if she can return safely to the skies. The honor of flying squadron leader Jeffrey Stevenson's newly built Spitfire in front of his daughters, Victoria and Varian, goes to John Romain. He's one of the most experienced Spitfire pilots in the world. There's an American pilot that then one day he flew a Spitfire and somebody said to him, what's the big difference? And he said, the big difference is that you, you get into an American fighter, but you put a Spitfire on. It's all too good to be true, really. It's just, it's crazy, isn't it? The starting procedure is the same today as it was when N3200 made its last flight in 1940. The stick is pulled back so the plane won't nose over upon starting. The gas primer is pulled to warm the engine. Both tanks are checked for fuel. A small amount of throttle is applied. The ignition switches are flicked. Right, I reckon this is it. Right. I heard the words. And the starter button is pressed. I'm not an emotional person. To get an emotional response out of me would take a fair bit of doing, really. But what got it for me was, just the way the Merlin ticking over and the plane shuddering, I genuinely thought that's, I genuinely got a shiver down the spine. Spitfire Golf Juliet, runway 24 grass. Take off at your discretion. Surface wind estimated 26. Zero degrees, one five knots. And good luck. And so after a two year build, on the very same runway it last flew from 74 years ago, they're about to see if this Spitfire can fly again. The canopy is left open to make an escape easier should anything go wrong. It's just all a bit magical. That's your dad's plane. Eh? A little tinge of sadness too, I suppose. Wearing its original Duxford Squadron marking of QV, Jeffrey Stevenson's plane is responding perfectly. All this effort is, is just uh, remarkable. And I, I'm so glad that it was, it's been focused on my father. That is something. He would have just been overjoyed to think that it's up and flying again. That would be. Yeah. Yeah. It'll take a while to um, sink in, I think. <clears throat> a bit quiet. Yeah. I don't know what to say, really. It's amazing that they've done that. These folks put it all together again. Mm. I've got goosebumps now. 
When he got out of that aeroplane, it was sort of uh, very uh, moving. Thank you so much. Pleasure, one on, on, yeah. nice. <laughs> Pleasure. Yeah. He looks like my father did, and um, it's like, oh, this came out all right, you know. Thank How you very was that? Much. Absolutely <laughs> amazing. Thank you very much indeed. Thank what was you. it like? Lovely. One of the best I've ever built, I think. <laughs> good to see you, did it? Oh, mate. <laughs> Spot on, mate. That's good. Yeah. That's good. I think it's lovely job. seeing it fly after all the your involvement with it. My bit of involvement. <laughs> Just the amount of time and effort your boys have put into this. Yeah. And actually, it is, I think, one of the best they've ever built. It's absolutely stunning. So, is it going to get a certificate to fly? Oh, most definitely. Yeah? Yeah. Brilliant job. Well, thank you very much. My <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> There's three bits of it, really. You know, it's, that's like a tribute to Jeffrey Stevenson, which I think that's great. Number two, we have restored a Mat 1 Spitfire to perfect condition. Where do we go from there? That is it. And then the third one, the job satisfaction. What a set of lads. None of those boys are dragging the heels to work. It's the boyhood dream to work on something like this. Such an iconic aircraft yeah. as well, you know, working on it, you couldn't get anything better, could you? N3200 to me is my favourite of all time. It's just a beautiful looking aircraft. We're all normal guys doing what we enjoy doing, but at the end of the day we've been given the task to make a Mark 1 Spitfire the best we can. I think it's turned out pretty good. It's been emotional, it's been emotional, it's been emotional. All of it.